Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN. We're a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I am honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Matt Abrahams and Kim Scott. Oh, it's going to be such a great night. Thank you for joining us. FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of over 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Matt Abrahams is a leading expert in communication with decades of experience as an educator, author, podcast host, and coach. As a lecturer in organizational behavior at Stanford's Uni Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, he teaches popular classes in strategic communication and effective virtual presenting. He received Stanford Business School's Alumni Teaching Award in recognition of his teaching students around the world. Matt is a sought after keynote speaker and communication consultant. He has helped countless presenters improve and hone their communication, including some who have delivered IPO roadshows, as well as TED Talks, the World Economic Forum and Nobel Prize presentations. His online talks garner millions of views and he hosts the popular award-winning excellent podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart. Joining him, someone that we love, Kim Scott is the co-founder of Radical Candor, a company to help leaders build more radically candid organizations. She's the author of the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Radical Candor, Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity, and the forthcoming Radical Respect, How to Work Together Better. Keep an eye out. Kim was a CEO coach at Dropbox, Qualtrics, Twitter, and other tech companies. She was a member of the faculty at Apple University and before that led AdSense, YouTube, and DoubleClick teams at Google. And now let's welcome Matt Abrahams and Kim Scott. Thank you so much, Lonnie. It's a pleasure to be here with you and, and it's a pleasure to be with you, Kim. Thank you. I'm thrilled to see you and uh, excited to take our next walk together. You, Matt and I are neighbors, for those of you who don't know. So... I'm ex and I'm also really excited to learn from you. I think a great teacher is a great human being. So uh, so I think we're all going to have a, a great time tonight. Well, thank um, you. You're, well, thank you. So my first question for you as a writer and also as a reader is why did you, first of all, thank you for writing the book because writing is a labor of love. But what prompted you to write this book? Well, the, the fact of the matter is quite simple. A lot of our communication happens in the moment. It's not planned. Yeah. It's not the presentation. It's not the meeting yeah. with agenda. It's it's happening in the moment. People asking questions, giving feedback. And there really is not much out there at all. And the origin of my interest in this dates back to about a decade when the, the deans at Stanford's business school came to me and said, we have a problem. Our amazingly bright students are struggling to answer when the professor says, what do you think? The dreaded cold yeah. call. So that yeah. really got me interested in thinking about how can we better equip our students, but more importantly, everyone to communicate better on the spot. So it was really born out of a specific need and a curiosity of mine to do the, the research and the work and build the methodology. And unlike you, Kim, writing is hard for me. I would much rather speak than write. And so you're right. It's it's more than for me, a labor of love. It was a labor to get this yeah. done, but, yes. but driven by passion to get the information out, I got through it. So did you get your students to well to sort of look forward to being cold called like because there there, there yeah. it is an existential dread and I don't know if for those of you who didn't go to business school like the, half your grade comes from uh, what happens when you're you walk in and your professor says you know so, what's going on in this case Kim and and you know if you haven't read it you're in real trouble but <laughs> that, that's but, a problem but, yes. but even if you have read it, it can be an intimidating moment. And I think life is often like a cold call. Uh, so. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you and I both have children roughly around the same age. It is yeah. always on the spot yeah. having to respond. Uh, so I personally do not cold call my students. I, th I think, it, it. you know, when we're trying to build communication skills and knowledge of communication, to mm -hmm. put people under stress like that is just not appropriate. I do believe in warm calling where I'll tell my students, I'll say, you know, midway through class, we're going to have a discussion on this topic. Know that I want yeah. to hear from you. So everybody becomes aware and they're prepared. But you're right. Life is full of cold calls. It, it happens yeah. all the time. 
Yeah, yeah. And so one of the things that I loved about your your book is that there's this myth that that kind of communication is an innate talent. And you say, no, it's not an innate talent. So so talk to me about how we can learn how to develop this skill, that it's not something we're either born with or not. Right. So so the book and, and my whole approach to teaching communication is full of counterintuitive ideas. And, and one of the counterintuitive ideas is, is you're born with it or you're not. And that's absolutely not true. Yeah. We can all get better at communication. I've seen it in my own personal life and my students, the people I coach. It takes time. It takes practice. We start at different levels and different places, but we can absolutely get better. The book details a methodology and you can step into that methodology at any point. But where a great place to start is by reminding yourself that just like any skill, if you're learning a musical instrument, you're learning a new sport or an activity, it really boils down to three things, repetition, reflection and feedback. You have to practice. Now we have to practice in a place where it feels comfortable or not as uncomfortable as a high stakes situation. We have to reflect what's working, what's not working. We have to observe others and see what's working for them and what's not working. And then finally, we have to get feedback. So when it comes to learning communication, it's really about repetition, reflection, and feedback. And the methodology that I provide and help people with takes you through the steps and gives you ideas and advice and guidance on the reps to do and how to look for feedback and some specific questions to ask yourself to do that reflection. So can we talk a little bit about practicing? Because I have found that when, when I am teaching classes on feedback, I'll try to get people to do role plays. And they're, they're, that is the moment when people leave the class. Yeah. They hate. So how can we get people to practice? Like the repetition sounds sort of easy, but but it's actually really hard to do. In fact, sometimes I find that I'm I feel more nervous and uncomfortable when I'm practicing giving a talk than when I'm actually on stage giving a talk. Because when I'm practicing, I don't have the adrenaline that's kind of pushing me from one one thing to another. So how, how do you get over the natural reluctance to practice? Yeah, well, I, agree I see it. You. Yeah, I see it in my in my practice as well. When when I say we have to role play or we're going to practice, a lot of people tune out or, or step yeah. out. And God forbid, yeah. do a breakout room in a virtual session and people just disappear. But yeah. You know, a lot of the communication that we're talking about happens naturally. And so mm -hmm. to, to say, I have to go build this practice, just become more mindful of what you're doing. When you walk yeah. to the grocery store and, and you have a conversation with the checkout clerk or something, that yeah. becomes a practice opportunity for spontaneous yeah. communication and you can adjust and adapt it. So I think part of the challenge is we, we see these practices as really intense and we feel the spotlight on ourselves when in fact, for spontaneous speaking, we can look at everyday interaction as a as a way to practice. Yeah. So, so we are practicing all the time. We are practicing all the time. Yeah. You and I at this very moment are practicing spontaneous speaking. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important. What do you think about AI? So one of the things that that yeah. we've developed is this uh, this opportunity to talk with a with with a, a well-trained yeah. robot that actually, and, and we come up with scenarios, you know, you have to tell this it's for, for kind of higher stakes, convers spontaneous conversations. And one of the things that is fun is you can put three people together to have this conversation with this robot, which you couldn't really do in real life. And then they can talk to each other about, oh, don't say they, that, do say this. What do you think about that? Like we drill. I was just I was just uh, speaking with the um, with the Positive Coaching Alliance, uh -huh. and yeah. and we were talking about soccer. And I said there are all kinds of soccer drills, but for these high stakes conversations, or even for conversations that we think are low stakes, and then they become very high stakes, we have no drills. So what are what are some what are some specific examples of drills people can do? Well, first, I am impressed that we went a whole 11 minutes before we mentioned the word AI. So that that's that's pretty good. I, I thought it might come up sooner. Uh, and I love the tool that you've developed. And I know you and I have talked about it where you can actually practice with AI. And I think a wonderful tool, I think a wonderful use of AI is to practice with our communication, specifically spontaneous communication. Yeah. I actually encourage my students 
when they have to give a presentation where there's Q&A to use generative AI to ask it questions, Ooh, to ask them a good questions idea. they can then practice. Yeah. So you need to think about scenarios that you can ask others to help you with. Uh, you know, back in the old olden days, like a few years ago, you know, just write on a note card a particular question that you might get or just a topic you might uh, bring up in small talk, shuffle the cards, pick one up and just respond. So there are ways to to give you practice opportunities. We have to consciously think about what it is we're trying to practice. So mm -hmm. we have intention behind what we're doing. And then we have to, after we're done practicing, take time to reflect on what worked and what didn't. The biggest problem for many people is they they are so busy that they just jump on to the next situation and they don't take yeah. time to reflect. The real learning happens after the fact when you reflect what worked and what didn't. So AI is a great tool, getting groups of practice together. You know, if you are pitching a business or a product or a service and you know you're going to be in front of people asking questions and asking for your feedback, you should definitely simulate that as you move yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. What What's an example of a way to practice at the grocery store? I like that idea. <laughs> <Next>. <laughs> Well, so I think there are lots of opportunities for interactions at the grocery store. So uh, simply asking a, que a question can work really well. If you want to get um, some Q&A skills going, you can ask somebody about what do you recommend? You know, if you're at the meat counter, what do you recommend? And have yeah. somebody make a recommendation and then you ask a question back. Small talk is something I, you know, when I wrote the book in the back, the latter part of the book, the second half is six scenarios or situations where you apply some of the skills in the first half of the book, the methodology. Yeah. It's feedback, it's Q&A, it's introducing yourself, apologizing, etc. The one that I did not expect to be most interesting to most people was small talk. Yes. The grocery store is a wonderful place to practice small talk skills. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The best way, yeah, there's several ways to do small talk well. One is to just comment on something you notice in the environment. A, a grocery store, lots of things to comment on. So yeah, I would go in and take that as a, as a lovely opportunity to practice small talk. And it, can, it doesn't have to be a grocery store. It could be when you go into work, when you yeah. read uh, the receptionist, when you sit down in a meeting to first start. Just have that intention, and that's when we actually can improve our skills. Yeah. Well, I also love what you said. In addition to practicing, you want to observe what's happening, and then you want to get feedback. And you know I love to talk about feedback. So <laughs> do you like this... feedback, Kim? I didn't know. Yeah. I do. I do. Yeah. I was, in fact, I want to get some from you. But first, I want to hear. So you have a, such a good story. In the, we're, I know we're going to talk about observing and feedback as we go. Right. But you have such a good story that I want to make sure folks have a chance to hear which is you, you often had to, you often got cold called as a yeah. child because yeah. of the first letter of your name. So yeah. talk, talk to me about what happened yeah. and so, why that was a big deal. Well, I said that everybody can improve in their public speaking and their spontaneous speaking. Certain people have different experiences coming to yeah. it. I certainly had a lot of opportunity to speak in the moment and speak spontaneously. My last name starts with an A, B. It, there are only three times in my life I have not been first alphabetically. One is at Stanford's Business School. We have a wonderful professor and friend named Jennifer Ocker, who's AA. A -A. Uh, right. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I usually always come first. So, you know, I was a high school teacher for two years. I know how easy it is just to sit everybody alphabetically. So I always knew where I sat and I always knew that I would go first. So for me, a lot of my academic career from elementary school, even through graduate yeah. school, was uh, being put on the spot. So uh, it is a challenge. It's something that, that that has helped me feel more comfortable with it. But the reality is, you know, uh, there are lots of times where all of us are put on the spot and we just have to remind ourselves that we can learn to manage the anxiety and communicate effectively when we're there. Yeah. And try to relish. I mean, some people really don't like being put on the spot. Mm -hmm. Other people love it. There's this, I saw this great <laughs> one man show and he was like spotlight yeah. <laughs> and, and he was never happier than when in the spotlight so it is so so learning to love it when you're put on the spot is a is a, is a great well and, and i think a great way to help yourself do that is just remind yourself that often when you are put on the spot people want to hear what you have to say you have it yeah. remind yourself you have value to bring you know, if somebody asks you a question, they want to know the answer. If somebody asks you for feedback, they want to get feedback. Yeah. So 
you're in a position to give them something of value and something you want. Many of us think like, oh, I, I, I've got to do this right. Or we start judging, I should be better prepared. In fact, you're being asked to, to respond. And, and that's because people want to get something from you and you have that value to bring. Yeah, I think that is so important. I often, when when there were people on my team who didn't speak up very much, that is exactly what I told them. I said, you know, you're on this team because we want to hear from you. We it's it, and and I think that sometimes people get in this mindset like, oh, you know, I'm doing everybody a favor to remain silent. Uh -huh. uh, but <laughs> and often that's because there's someone in the room who's bloviating. And yes. and so just reminding those quiet people, you are not bloviating. <laughs> you're 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 actually we want to. So and the more that more the quiet people speak up, the less the bloviators bloviate. So right. So no, Kim, I, I, this is an issue I get uh, asked a lot, which is uh, how do I feel comfortable speaking in a room where lots of folks are talking? So yeah. I'd actually like to ask you a question. I'm curious, what was, what, help me understand what you actually said to somebody who is reticent in a group. What kind of feedback would you say to encourage them? You know, the words that you would use. And then I'd love to get your insight on how do you stop the bloviator from sucking yes. all the blood out of the room? Yes, because I've got some ideas too. I'd love to hear yours. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that because that's yeah. an important part of of being successful is is making sure helping to give the quiet ones a voice. Whether you are the quiet one or you're maybe a loud one, and you want to make sure you're sharing the stage. Mm -hmm. I what I said to this person is that very often it feels like it is a selfish thing to express yourself. But if you can flip that on its head and realize that you are withholding something that is valuable from other people, like what you have to say is valuable and we want to hear it. And and even if you're wrong, it's valuable because then it gives us an opportunity to talk about it, you know. And and I think also that this person, the, the person I'm thinking of also didn't want to speak up until they were certain that they were right and that yes. they had all the facts. And what I said is that certainty is awesome when you have it, but a hypothesis is also <laughs> really helpful. So share your hypothesis with a group and that'll help us get to the truth faster. So I, I, you you recommend there what I also recommend, which is it, it, basically you're reframing the lack of contribution to be yeah. withholding something yes. versus risking something. Yes. And I really like how you use the analogy of a hypothesis, because many of us are comfortable hypothesizing and then trying yeah. to figure out if that's right. So so reframing that can be really helpful. And I, and I hope everybody listening takes value from that. That, that, that. That's very useful and actionable feedback. And what you're working on there is mindset. So so thank you. So so I, yeah, I know you're supposed to be interviewing me, but I'm curious, how do you <laughs> shut up the bloviator? So one of my favorite, if you're in person, one of my favorite, Richard Tedlow was a business school professor of mine and a colleague of mine at Apple University. And he taught me a couple of things. If you're in person and someone's bloviating, you walk towards them. It's tempting to walk away, especially if they're bloviating loudly, which they often are. But if you walk towards the person who's speaking very loudly and very long, they often just naturally quiet down. Mm -hmm. So that was one tip. Another, another tip was you can actually walk towards them and sort of body block them if you're the one who's conducting the conversation and say, thank you so much. Now I'd like to hear from other people. And then right. you physically block them. Uh, and if they're sitting and you're standing, even if you're very short as I am, that can, that can work. Um, another thing that can be helpful is to talk to the person about just being more aware mm -hmm. of their of the amount of time they're speaking. And there's a lot of there's a lot of apps out there that will actually tell you, you know, there were 10 people in the room and you spoke 50% of the time. So, you, right. you know, your goal was to speak 10% of the time. And so right. that I think is is like sometimes quantifying what's going on can be very helpful because it doesn't seem to them that they're talking so much. Right. I like that your approach is nonverbal. Uh, you know, I, I, I learned, a I only taught high school for two years, and this is decades ago. I learned so much about 
communication, teaching, mm -hmm. interacting. And one of the very first things they teach you in classroom management is move towards the thing you want yes. to, to change and move away from the thing you want to encourage. So yes. if students are participating, and engaging, you step back. So physical presence makes a lot of sense. Now, obviously, in the mode we are in today, that would be hard to do. The, the advice I give people, in addition to what you're talking about, awareness building, physical space usage, uh, is to paraphrase. So I interrupt in, with extracting something of value that somebody has said. I name yeah. it, I recognize it, and then I move on. So if we're having yeah. this discussion about implementation and you're going on and on, I might say, cost is something that's really important, Kim. In fact, I'm very curious, what does Lonnie think yeah. about cost? So I've not only recognized you, but I've purposely taken the attention away and focused it elsewhere. And that to me is a way that we can stop the over talkers and the over contributors. Yes. There's another great book by Dan Lyons called yes. STFU. Yeah, uh, we won't spell out what that is. This yes, is a friendly yes, audience. Yes, but, yes. But uh, yes, uh, Dan's great. I had him on my podcast. He's a super nice guy. And it's really, uh, he talks a lot about awareness building. <laughs> How do you know if you are yeah. an over talker? Yeah. And he's got lots of recommendations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really enjoyed that book. And I think it's important to be, to have some compassion for the bloviator because very often they're not aware of they're doing it or they're doing it because they're nervous. And so you want to, you want to help them. You don't want to sort of punish them. That's right. I, I think that there there was another, there's a question and that, did you have something else for me or can I? Cause no, no, I'm absolutely, I, I'm curious where you're going to go. <laughs> there's something that I really loved in your book about the difference between sort of spontaneous speaking and public speaking. So, so that's like the difference between having a conversation, being part of a conversation at a loud rowdy dinner party and being on stage, like it, it, spontaneous speaking may be harder than public speaking, actually. Oh, I actually, I absolutely think it is because you have to manage so many things. Yeah. You know, we, we don't, many people, most people don't like public speaking because yeah. everybody's looking at you, but it's a much more controlled environment than small talk at a party or having to apologize or introduce yourself. It can be very challenging. Uh, and we often use the wrong comparison and the wrong metrics and rubrics to evaluate yeah. our spontaneous speaking. You know, we look at TED speakers. I know you've you've given a TEDx talk, which is great. I've been on the stage. We've seen other people. And we, we see that and we say, that's great communication. And then when we answer a question, we might fumble over it. We might sound more conversational. We say, oh, we're just awful at it. We're comparing apples to oranges. Yeah. It's very different. I mean, yeah. Kim and I are here to tell any of you who've never done a formal like TED talk, there's a lot lot of practice that goes into that and you a are a huge amount of practice. very yeah and and if it's done well it looks like it's extemporaneous and conversational but there's a so it much practice. Not. So, yeah. no not at all and so we we need to make sure we compare ourselves with the right measures yeah and think about people who answer questions well or people who give really good feedback or or make good small talk effortlessly those are the people we should look to see what they're doing not these big high stakes uh communication so they are different speaking spontaneously and speaking in a planned way very different it, it's almost like slow twitch and fast twitch muscles you know, yes. they're both muscles, but we're doing it in where their purpose is very different. And the way you strengthen and enhance them and evaluate them is also very different. Yeah. You know, one of the best bits of advice I got for spontaneous speaking was from uh, from a person who I had worked for. And then I was going to he had gone to business school and I was about to go to business school. And I was very nervous about business mm -hmm. school. And he said, try if you're in a conversation and you feel like everybody else in the room knows more than you is you know has the skills that are the coin of the realm and you don't have those skills he he said here's what you do you listen for the first half of the conversation don't try to and then jump in maybe halfway or two-thirds of the way through the conversation and summarize what you've heard like you mm -hmm. you know so yeah. you you've listened and then and then try to change the conversation try to yep. be the pivot uh, that makes it more interesting and that was so that was such helpful advice what do you think of that i mean it worked so in that, business school but what a, where else could i think you that works that? in in many conversations so a few things you said there are definitely things i recommend first start from listening you know in small talk many of us want to be amazingly interesting 
And yeah. I interviewed and have gotten to know a, a, a wonderful person. Her name is Rachel Greenwald. Super fascinating. She is an academic and a professional matchmaker. Think about that. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so she taught me something about small talk that I think is really important. The goal is to be interested, not interesting. Yes. And when you are trying to be interested, you're listening, you're paraphrasing, you're asking questions. Now, those who study conversation make a distinction between two types of turns you can take. If you think about it, most spontaneous speaking is turn taking. You speak, I speak, you speak, I speak. One type of turn is what's called a supporting turn. So mm -hmm. I encourage, I demonstrate listening, I ask you to continue the conversation. And then the other type of turn is a switching turn where I switch the topic. So if you and I were meeting and you, and you say to me, hey, Matt, I just got back from Hawaii, I had a great trip. A yes. supporting response would be, oh, what island did you go to? What did yeah. you do? A switching response would be to say, oh, I went to Costa Rica. Yeah. And there is a space and a place for both in conversation. Typically, you want more supporting responses than switching, but you need to do both. So the advice you receive to listen, to paraphrase and repeat what you heard, and then to occasionally switch is wonderful advice. And that's how the most effective conversations develop over time. I think one of the things that I love about what you just said is the importance of listening, like really, and going into the conversation without an agenda. I think that one of the one of the most important moments in my career was when I realized when I was having one on ones with my either with my boss or with my direct reports letting go of my own agenda and saying the goal here is to connect yes you know uh and, and to listen first to what's on their mind and to have the same kind of mentality that one has when having dinner with an old friend like i don't sit down before i'm having dinner with an old friend and think about <laughs> make a list of topics you know right. i just i'm going to talk to that person and to find out what's on their mind. And sometimes in the in the course of that conversation, I find out what's on my mind. I didn't even know what was on my mind. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. In the book and in the work I do, I talk a lot about heuristic processing. A heuristic yeah. is a mental shortcut and, and, and it helps us survive in our lives. But there are times to turn off those heuristics yeah. where we just go in and we're present. Because if you have a, 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 a goal in mind, a strict goal in mind, it limits what you might do. So it's yeah. a fine line. And I know you probably struggle with, with this as well in the work you do teaching people about respect and giving feedback. You need to have intention, but mm -hmm. you don't want to be scripted and rigid in how that unfolds. So we, we want to have a, a, a general direction, a map I'm taking this conversation in. But at the same time, I don't want to be so detailed and so scripted that it that it prevents us from having that connection and discovering what's possible. And there's yeah. that fine line there, you know, in, and this is where I think structure comes in. And I talk a lot about structure in the book, because if you think about it, a jazz musician doesn't just make up any note. They actually yeah. play chord progressions that they've learned in the past. An athlete doesn't just do random stuff on the field or yeah. on the court. They do drills that they've practiced, but it is because of that preparation that they actually in the moment can be free and agile. So structure yeah. actually sets you free and it allows you to be present like you're talking about. It's not just willy nilly, I'm going to go in and see what's going on. I have a structure which is nothing more than a roadmap to help me get from A to B, but how I'm going to get there depends on what unfolds in the minute and then yeah. the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And also I think like having skills is different from having an agenda. Like, yes, you yes. know, um, yeah, that's good distinction. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important to have the skills and I, like, sometimes you do have an agenda, but that's also, that also happens, but be transparent about the agenda when you have it, I think. Uh, that's right. Better, yeah. Let people know in advance. And, yeah. and, and I think you, you don't even have to do it in, in the moment, you can, I, I think one of the most underutilized communication tools is meeting invites. Yes. You, know, you, can, you can set expectations in a meeting invite or in an email way yeah. before you have the conversation to make it easier for everybody. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, I agree, setting people's expectations up front, but it doesn't have to be in that moment. You can do it in advance. Yeah. Although even when I jump on a call with someone and yeah. they say, my goal in this call is I like my shoulders go, I'm like, thank God, I know which I don't have to guess what your goal is. You know? Right. 
it's right. a it's a it's a real kindness to be transparent about that. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So Matt, you have a sort of a six step talk mm -hmm. smarter method. I'd love to hear more about that from you. Right. So so in the many years that I've been developing this, uh, and it's all based on academic research from the fields of psychology, sociology, anthropology, neuroscience, even improvisation and acting, uh, the six steps really divide into two categories, mindset and messaging. And the first four steps are all about your approach and mindset. And the first mm -hmm. place you have to start, I believe, although you can start anywhere, is really about managing anxiety, taking the bite out of the anxiety that most of us feel. Yeah. Most people feel nervous communicating in front of others. It is made even more intense when it is spontaneous. So there are things we can do to manage anxiety, and I'm happy to talk more about it. But at the highest level, you have to manage both symptoms, that's what you physiologically experience, and sources, the things that initiate and exacerbate that anxiety. The second step is really getting out of our own way. Many of us, when we communicate, and we touched on this a little bit, we want to do it right. Yeah. There is no right way to communicate. I know you say this when you talk about giving feedback. There's no one right way to do it. Yeah. There are better ways and worse ways, certainly, but there is no one right way. And that pressure we put on ourselves to do it right gets in the way of us doing it at all. I have the audacity, Kim. I don't know if you know this. On the very first day of my class with my MBA students, I say, maximize your mediocrity in your communication. And their jaws <laughs> drop. I mean, these papers, <laughs> that, what? But the logic is, if you allow yourself just to do what you're doing, just focus on connecting, don't focus yeah. on evaluating and judging every single yeah. thing you say, you actually free up more cognitive bandwidth yeah. to do better. Yeah. So that's, that's the really second smart. step. Yeah. Yeah. It's about connection, not perfection. And then the third step is to see it as an opportunity, not a threat or a challenge. Many of us, when we're asked a question, asked mm -hmm. to introduce ourselves, give feedback, we feel like we're being threatened or challenged. This is a crucible. We have to, a test we have to pass. Instead, if we flip it and say, this is an opportunity to share, to learn, to connect, then we can approach it differently. It changes our demeanor. It changes our content. And then the fourth and final step of the mindset piece has to do with listening. Mm -hmm. Listening is critical. And I know you feel yeah. listening is critical as well. When you're giving feedback, when you're receiving feedback, you've got to listen. Most of us listen just enough to get the gist of what somebody says. In fact, I had a colleague the other day, Kim, who said, uh, listening is just what you do when you're waiting for your turn to speak, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no, not exactly. Um, and then the second two part, the, the second part, the last two steps are structure, which I've already alluded to, the importance of leveraging a structure. And then the mm -hmm. final is what I call the F word of, of all of this, which is focus. Many of us say more than we need to when yeah. we communicate. We're taking our audience on a journey of our discovery of what we want to say as we're saying it. We list and itemize. We can be much more focused, much more clear and concise. So when we take the mindset pieces and put them together with the messaging pieces, we actually have all of the tools that we need to be effective in the moment. And again, we don't have to do all the steps. We don't have to do them all in order. But it is those steps that allow us to be more comfortable and confident in the moment. I love what you, I love all of that. Uh, I lo and, and I love that you boil, boil it down to six steps. Like these are things that you all can do today. Everybody listening can do today. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. I also really love what you tell your MBA students. Like, <laughs> and, like uh, so talk to me a little bit about the, there's a little bit of tension between talk smarter and embrace mediocrity, uh, which I <laughs> yeah. enjoy. Right. Uh, well Right. So one, one, I believe, enables the other. So, yes. you know, th this is a concept that's borrowed from improvisation. And I have had the good fortune to work with some amazing improvisers. I co-teach a class with Adam Tobin. I work with Dan mm -hmm. Klein, Patricia Ryan Madsen. These are folks who are experts in improv. And improv has lots of philosophical approaches and maxims that really help. Yeah. And they have one that's called Dare to be Dull. You know, yes. we all want to be the big star. We all want to say the right thing. And sometimes the most effective thing to do is just get it done. Just say what yeah. you need to say. And so if you give yourself permission to just do what's needed in the moment and not evaluate and judge it as much as we normally would, it actually opens ourselves up so we can think faster and talk smarter. Thinking faster is not about speeding up your brain. Thinking faster is all about recognizing patterns in the moment that can help you. So when you practice in this way, when you reflect on what you're doing, you develop pattern recognition that helps you say, oh, that's the path I need to go down. 
and you get there more quickly. And that's yeah. what it's all about. So when you maximize mediocrity, when you dare to be dull, you're freeing up cognitive resources to focus on what's important. And that is looking for patterns and connecting. And that's how that tension balances itself out. So one yeah. enables the other. Yeah. I think also the the genius of maximizing mediocrity is that very often when we are talking to other people, there's there's research that shows that if someone is super critical or negative, they look smarter than if they're really positive. <laughs> Right. And and remember, your your goal is actually not to look smarter. Your goal is to connect with the other right. person and uh, and to make them uh, feel smarter, not not make yourself look smarter. Right. That's important, I think. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that I appreciate so much about your work and the radical candor methodology is that the emphasis is on the other person and helping the other person. Yeah. It is very easy to focus on us and ourselves. But communication, the, the origin of the word communication means to make common. It has built yes. into the idea, yes. that, built in the idea that it's about the other, it's about the relationship. And so we need to keep that in mind. You know, the, yeah. in, in psychology, they have this thing called the spotlight effect. We all feel like we're walking around with a spotlight shining on us yeah. and everybody's looking at us. The reality is everybody's walking around under their own spotlight, yeah. so self-absorbed. So any effort you make to connect, to extend, to be in service of the other really makes a big difference. And it yeah. helps you because the focus is on where it needs to be. And it's not cluttering your, your, your own thinking with all the concerns you have about yourself. Yeah. I rem when I was uh, I, probably like six or seven years old, we my parents took me to some big holiday gathering, some big party. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very shy. And I didn't talk to anybody. And I was kind of grouchy, you know, the way, the way a child is. And I remember my father asked me how I was feeling at the party. And I told him and he said, I bet there were 30 other people there who felt the same way you did. So instead of focusing on how bad you feel, focus on how other people are feeling and what you can do to make them, you know, to make it more pleasant for them instead of, and that, you know, that was good advice from dear old Absolutely. dad. And, and really I can helped. see how that thread is carried through some of the work that you do even to this day. <laughs> Isn't it amazing the impact that, that early yeah. childhood can have on yeah, us? Yeah, some little, some little incident, uh, you being at the first of the... <laughs> first of the alphabet. Well, that, and, and, and I'll tell a quick story. This is where I really think my interest in, in speaking and communication came about. Uh, I grew up not very far from where you and I live, Kim. And uh, my mother got frustrated one weekend with my brother and me, all the, the toys and crap we had. And she said, we're having a garage sale. In the community I grew up in, there were lots of garage sales. And my yeah. mother said to publicize our garage sale so it stands out from all the others, misspell the word garage. And if you insert a B in the middle of the word garage, you have a garbage, garbage sale, sale. That we had. <laughs> and we sold more stuff than anybody else that weekend. And it <laughs> dawned on me that the language you use, the words that you use can influence mm -hmm. people's behavior. Now, my mother is convinced that because we said garbage, we stood out. I think people thought we were stupid and would get better deals, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> It still taught me the lesson that, yeah. that language and communication works. And that was when I was seven or eight. And I think that really sparked my interest in communication, much yeah. like your dad's advice led to this notion of empathy in the work that you do. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So can we talk about listening for a minute? Because it sounds easy to say listen, uh, but it's hard to do. So what are your what are your tips for better listening? Yeah, listening. We we listen just enough to accomplish this. Now I have to tell you, uh, my wife, who's on the other side of this door, would get very uh -huh. upset that I'm teaching listening skills because she would argue I'm still a work in progress. But to me, the the best. If you said you have only one bit of advice to give to listen, it would be this: listen for the bottom line, not the top line. When we listen to really understand what is the person really saying it changes the way we listen. We listen more intently, we focus more, we, we exhibit more empathy. In the book, I talk about a methodology I borrowed from a colleague of mine, his name's Collins Dobbs, and he teaches a class on crucial, critical, managerial conversations. Mm -hmm. And he teaches a methodology that actually applies to listening. And it's three things, pace, space, grace. We have to slow down to listen well. Many of us live very busy lives. We're always running around. We have devices binging and beeping. You need to slow down. Listening is not something you do quickly. 
Second, you have to give yourself space. Sometimes it's physical space. Move to a place that's more quiet. But more importantly, it's mental space. I have to focus my attention, be in the moment to really be present with you. And then grace. Grace has to do with giving yourself permission to listen, not just to what is said, but how it is said, where it is said, when it is said. And then grace also to listen to the intuition you have that comes up as a result. So we have to listen internally as well as externally. When we listen in that way, evoking pace, space, and grace, listening for the bottom line, we really hear better. We, we take away more. We see and sense nuance. And those who we're listening to feel the experience very differently as well. And it's a way of connecting, building trust, building relationships. So listening is so important in all of communication. And I know you see that in the work you do with respect, yeah. with regards to respect, but also with feedback. You have to listen. Yeah, yeah, that's the first That's the first step to everything, to feedback, also to getting things done. I mean, the biggest yeah. mistake I made in my career was not listening to my team. And, <laughs> uh, and pretty soon they all, they, you know, they, they want to work for other people. Yeah. So, so that's totally true. agree with you. And the grace part of listening, I really like a lot. It, it, and I think it's probably also extending grace to the other person, because you yes. may disagree vehemently. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a year where we could all extend more grace when we disagree. Vehemently. I don't know what you're talking about, but absolutely. No, you're you're right. We're, yeah, we all have to, to extend grace. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the way you do. I like a lot of what you talk about when you talk about understanding versus agreement. And, and you, you can understand somebody and not agree and you can give them feedback that's related to that rather than escalating. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's really important. Yeah. I think one of the things that someone I forgot who told me this, but they said, if you're, if you're having a disagreement with someone and you're really trying to listen, one of the, one of the tricks you can use, because it's tempting to like shut your mind when you disagree, it's, right. we, we, that is a natural instinct. So don't give yourself some grace if that's what you're doing. But I think one of the things that can really help is to sort of remind yourself, if I listen closely to what this other person said, then I can improve my own thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, if nobody ever challenges us, if we if we never disagree with someone else, our thinking becomes quite shallow. So I, th I think it was John Stuart Mill who said this, actually. That's who it was. Wow. That, um, that, yeah, that's a reference. Go. Good for you. There you go. No, I, I think there's a lot of research out of the creativity field and other things that when we get out of our own head and we, and we yeah. allow ourselves to listen and input what others say, we, we, we become better. Our ideas are better. Our problem solving gets better. I, yeah. I, absolutely. So I'd love to double click on the mindset shifts because you've sure. talked about that a couple of times. And then in the book, I think there's four specific mindset shifts that you recommend to folks. So what, what right. are those? Yeah. So when it comes to this notion of seeing spontaneous speaking as an opportunity versus a yeah. threat, one of the ways to do that is to invoke a, a new mindset. And, and there are four mindset shifts that I think are very valuable and they come from very different realms. So let me share each of the four with you. The first comes from the amazing work of Carol Dweck. I know you're familiar yes, with it. love it, Carol Dweck. Absolutely, the growth mindset. That is that we have the ability to change ourselves and our, and our way of being in the world. We're not fixed. It's not yes. locked in stone. And it, one of the things she talks about is this notion of not yet. So if I happen to have a communication that doesn't go the way I want, or it doesn't result in the things that I was hoping for, rather than saying, I'm doomed, I'm never going to succeed in this, we simply say, not yet. I have the yeah. ability to develop those skills through practice, through observation. So many of us, when things don't go the way we want, simply say, not yet, and you can develop those skills. I've seen this play out in my own life. I know you know this, but I've, I've been doing martial arts for decades, mm -hmm. and it's been a wonderful tool of personal development. And I say, not yet a lot. But over time, yes. I gain those skills and then something else confronts me and I say not yet to that. So that's the first mindset shift. Give yourself permission to take a growth mindset to say not yet. The second comes from the world of improvisation. And I love improv. Improv teaches, I mean, the fundamental maxim of improv is yes and. 
And when you take a yes and approach to life, yeah, you got a book there have, that's all about it. it. It's right there. It's right there yeah. somewhere yes. behind me. I love yes. that. Kelly, Kelly Leonard's, Leonard's book, book, Yes And, yes. Uh, it, it's this notion of yes and is really, really valuable. And I'm not saying you say yes to everything. That yet, yeah, there you go. That would be that would be dangerous, especially as a parent of two teens. But at least looking at a situation and saying yes and. So if I'm in a challenging situation, I'm doing Q&A and somebody really comes hot and heavy with me, uh, I can say yes and. Where, where are the points where we agree? Well, we might disagree on the approach, but we, we both agree that this is important. So I lean into those areas where I can say yes, and that opens up doors and opportunities for me to connect and build. So taking a yes and approach can really help opening your mindset and opening up opportunities. The third that. mindset beyond not yet and yes and comes from the world of sport. Uh, there was a famous basketball coach, Mike Krzyzewski, Coach K. Uh, he taught all of his players this notion of next play. And this has now been infused in all sport. You talked about talking with PCA, Positive Coaching Alliance, wonderful organization. They teach this notion of next play. So if you do something in a sport that doesn't go the way you want, you don't sit in the moment and regret and ruminate you got to get moving. If I'm a basketball player and I miss a shot, the whole team, mine and the other team, yeah. are down the court ready to score. And if I'm sitting there, I'm not contributing. So when something doesn't go well, next play. Avoid ruminating in the moment. In the future, when the event is done, that's where reflection comes in. Reflection is important, but reflection doesn't happen in the moment. Reflection happens after the fact. So yeah. next play, if something doesn't go the way you want, immediately say next play, move on. And then later learn from the mistake. And then the final is a reframe. The final of the four mindset shifts is a reframe on the on mistakes. We have all heard the platitude that you learn from mistakes. And that's right. You do. Absolutely. Watch a child. They learn from mistakes. But we can all change how we feel about mistakes. Many of us don't want to make a mistake. We, we, we are averse to making mistakes. So I like to reframe a mistake. I call it a missed take. You know, in television production, movie production, they do lots of takes. Yeah. Take one, take two with the clapboard. No one take is bad or wrong. They're just trying something different. The director might say, stand up this time, sit down next time, yeah. say it with this emotion versus that emotion. And by seeing mistakes, things that don't go the way you want as missed takes, it can really help. I do this all the time. I'm in the middle of teaching. We're having a big interaction. I say something that didn't go the right way. I'll say to myself, take two, and I'll just try yeah. it again. And there's no pain. It's just an opportunity to do it again. So long-winded there, but there are four, four mindset shifts, not yet, yes and, next play, and missed takes. And if you adopt one or more of them, it can really help you see your communication opportunistically. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So a good friend of mine, just her ex-husband just got remarried and she mm. had to help her children write mm -hmm. toasts for the mm -hmm. wedding. So this was fraud. Mm. So give her some advice. Like what is, what's some advice, what makes a great toast? Yeah. So in the second part of the book, I cover lots of different spontaneous speaking yes. situations. Some of them, toasts and tributes, some of them are actually planned. That is that we have time to prepare as, as in the case you're giving. Other times we're at a work function and somebody says, hey, you were on the team. Why don't you stand up and say something? So we often have to give yeah. spontaneous toasts. We have all been victimized by bad toasts. Toasts yes. that go on too long, toasts that have insider knowledge that you don't understand, toasts that are more about the person giving the toast than yes. the event or the other person. Lots of things can go wrong in toasts. So as with all of the situations I talk about in the second part of the book, I, I try to root it or anchor it in a structure. And I believe a very easy structure to invoke when you're put on the spot to give a toast is the word what, W-H-A-T. The what explains why we're here. Now, if you're at a wedding, you don't right. have to say we're here at a wedding. People yeah. get that. But if yeah. you're uh, if you're in the, doing an all hands meeting and you're asked to give a toast or tribute to a team, you might have to say we're here to celebrate the launch of this product or the rolling out of this product. So sometimes you have to say why are we here? The the W. Yeah. Then the H is how are you connected? Often people like to know, why are you speaking? Now, if you're the manager of the team giving the tribute, everybody knows that. You don't have to say I'm the manager of the team. Yeah. But if you're at a wedding, people might want to know, why are you speaking? Yeah. I've known the groom for 20 yeah. years. Right now, people yeah. are like, oh, I get it. And then the A stands for anecdote. You want to give a clear, concise, accessible anecdote, not a full-on long story, but an anecdote or two. 
And then the T of what is some kind of thanks or toast at the end. So if you're uh, giving a tribute to a team who's rolled something out, you might say something like, thank you to all of you for your hard work and for yeah. helping us release the product on time. That's the T. If you're actually at a wedding or a quinceanera, bar mitzvah, whatever, something you're celebrating, you simply give a toast. Cheers to the couple. Cheers to the young individual. And that's how you wrap. So think of it as why are you here? How are you connected? Anecdote or two, and then finally conclude with a, a, a tribute, thanks or toast, and and that's how you that's how you structure it in the moment. And I think anecdotes, like the more we could practice anecdotes, anecdotes are so powerful for spontaneous mm -hmm. communication of all kinds, not only toast, but also uh, in 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 you know even in business. I remember one time there was some new feature. Uh, that had launched and I noticed it when I bought a pair of shoes on Zappos and I, I wanted to get a screenshot to show my team, but I uh, didn't get the screenshot fast enough. So I bought another pair of shoes and I, I used this anecdote. <laughs> The CEO of the company was like, expense those shoes. That's all, awesome. you know, so like even those small anecdotes are yeah. such a good way, I think. My, my favorite That's anecdote that I tell, and, and I think everybody should have a story or two in their back pocket that they can pull out and use in multiple situations. It's yes. sort of a multi-purpose tool. So uh, I have one the, the, and it starts like this. The biggest fight my wife and I have ever had was over toothpaste. My wife is a <laughs> roller and I'm a squeezer. Uh, and that gets a laugh, like you're saying, yeah. provocative, it's short. Yeah. And then I can turn that into a discussion about anything, about respect, yes. about yeah. openness, about yeah. oral hygiene. I mean, there's so uh, many things. So having about plastic toothpaste, one, yeah, exactly. I have to say the rolling doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Well, that's true. That's true. There you go. See? Um, although we still have two tubes of toothpaste just because of that. But the point okay. is having anecdotes in mind, yeah. anecdotes connect, they invite emotion, both as you as the person speaking it, but they invite and invoke emotion in others. It's great to have a few of those stockpiled, not scripted, but just in your back pocket that you yeah. can pull out when you need it. You use your Zappos example. I use my toothpaste example. Yeah. And, and that that's helpful. Yeah. So what do you do? I was working with a team actually the other day and and the, they were very frustrated because their boss tended to go around the room. There was never any room for spontaneous back and forth mm -hmm. conversation, which like the popcorn of ideas. And so they they asked me and I didn't have a great answer. Like, how can we how can we be how can we create a more spontaneous conversation? Uh, because the the team was very that they, they were you know I think the the manager was trying to do the right thing giving everyone time to speak yeah that but, equity piece which is yeah. very important in meetings but there are other yeah. ways to do it yes. well so one I would defer to you as the expert on feedback is what feedback could I give to the manager yes. to encourage him or her to to do that but for the participants. I think paraphrasing is an easy, low bar to do. So when you say something, and I know my turn's three from now, I might paraphrase. I'll say, hey, Kim, that point was really good. I'm curious. And I might ask a question or I might yeah. add my piece on top of it. So I'm being very polite. I'm respecting the space, but I'm showing that I listened and I'm adding to it. So by demonstrating that, maybe somebody else then asks you a question, says, you know, even though my turn's not asked, I might ask a question. So asserting yourself in a polite way that's not in the standardized order gets the conversation going. So like, and may I go out of talk? May I go out of turn? Something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. And all of a sudden, it signals to the manager that goodness can happen, and that people are willing to respect each other and give yeah. each other the floor. Because my hunch is that's why the person is doing that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you've demonstrated rather than going in and having to tell. Yeah, yeah. I think that is that is a great great point. Um, I think we're just about on time. I think Lonnie is coming, uh, uh -huh. but okay, here we go, Lonnie. I had another couple of questions, oh. but we'll do them in afterwards. Oh, yeah. that's right. At the after hours, absolutely. Well, I'm sure you have more than a couple more questions, Kim. Yes, I mean, you I too do. are like, if I, I wish I could bottle the energy and then sell it on the sidewalk, uh, I wouldn't have to fundraise. Uh, great, <laughs> great, great job. Love the preparation. Love the chemistry. It's just really, really solid. Uh, people are putting in tons of questions in to no surprise. I want to remind everyone, how can you continue this conversation? Ask your own questions of Kim and Matt. We've been putting things in chat about how to buy Matt's book. You buy it from our indie partner bookseller, The Bookstall. When you get your receipt from them for your purchase, the link to register for After Hours is right in that receipt. We're going to have another 55 minutes with these two nice people going from 8.05 to 9 o'clock Central. 
It is going to be, uh, if this is any indication, I doubt we're going to turn the dial down. I have a feeling it's only going to go up. <laughs> so come join us. Uh, I am going to, first of all, and also Kim, great job. Such a, such, such a great job. Really appreciate it. You're really just showing Matt. You offered him up on a on a platinum platter there. It was really, really delicious. Thank you it's so much for that. Uh, always fun to pro- talk to Matt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I bet. Uh, yeah, I can imagine those ta- those walks that you guys do with the dogs. I can only imagine. Uh, I want to make a quick program note. Uh, we are thrilled to be welcoming back to Fanland for, I think, third time. Carol Dweck will be uh, here in, we're thinking she'll be in Chicago with Fan on May 16th. That's a little, no one knows about this yet. Um, she's actually going to be interviewing for us one of her favorite people and a colleague of hers from the University of Chicago, Susan Golden Meadow. Uh, who I love her work, her work on gesture, which is going to be really amazing. So anyway, quick program note, May 16th, and we're thinking it's going to be in person. Uh, We love Carol. Um, Getting to the questions. So there's a, God, there's like, uh, it's a dealer's choice here. I'm going to go with a question from Lori. Uh, She says, um, how do you ensure that everyone involved in a challenging conversation feels heard and included? And how do you reflect on challenging conversations afterward to identify areas of personal growth? Great question. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to answer, but I'd love to hear Kim's answer as well. So <laughs> I, I, I think the first, I, I learn from Kim all the time. So I, <laughs> for me, the first response is I want, when somebody, when there's challenge, when there's conversation, I want to make sure that I demonstrate understanding and really have understanding. So validating understanding. And the best way to do that is to paraphrase, hey, here's what I hear the issue is, and to ask questions of clarification. So there's no sense in responding to something that's not on target. So you've got to make sure that you're you're focused on the target. What I hear you saying is, or what I hear the key issue here is for me, based on what you've said, is to really understand that. And then to share your perspective in a clear and concise way, and then check for understanding, not agreement, but check for understanding on the other person. So do you have questions about my position? So I'm demonstrating respect. I'm demonstrating the desire to actually hear what the person is saying. And then the the last part of the question is, how do you reflect on it? I have two simple questions I ask myself every evening at the end of the day. I say, what went well in my communication today and what's something I'd like to improve? Those are two simple questions. At the end of every week on Sunday, I go back and I actually write them down. I go back and look. And those are the things I work on for the next week. I'm looking for patterns and trends, not any one event, but a pattern or trend. I'm curious. I don't know, Kim, how you approach that. but sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, Kim approaches that. I think when 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 I find that maybe I have elicited a strong emotion from someone else, <laughs> which happens, uh, yes. I, I first of all, I, I like take a deep breath. When we communicate, we communicate on an intellectual plane and on an emotional plane at the same time. And if we mm-hmm. ignore the emotional signals or run away from the emotional signals, we're not going to communicate very well. So emotion is good. It's OK. It's like part of how we connect. And I find that if I if I have somehow made the other person mad or sad, I try to take an extra beat to show them that I care about them. And if they're brushing me off or ignoring me, then I kind of go further out. I challenge them even more directly. I say it again. I lean into it. And uh, and I think and it feels often, you know, it feels mean to do it. But I find it's not mean. It's just a way to get to clarity. Um, and then when I afterwards, like if it's in public, I won't do this in public, but afterwards I might ask the person, like, it seems like I made you mad in there. What is there, was there a better way for me to have said it? And I try not to over index. Like sometimes I'll get feedback. I've made one person really mad because I did one thing. That doesn't mean that one thing makes everybody mad, but like it, communication is complicated because what is going to make one person mad is another person's going to find funny. And so you've, you know, you've got to pay attention to the impact you have on others. Well, thanks so much for that. We're right at eight o'clock. So we're going to shut down here. We're going to say hi to Kim and Matt again in five minutes at about 805 central. We're going to give them a little break here. Thanks everybody for joining fan tonight. We hope to see you next week with Todd Rogers and Angela Duckworth. That will be another wah, wah, wah. I can't wait. Um, Thank you so much. Really great content, great energy. Just love, love, love it. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for showing up. We really appreciate it.